I'm here to talk about a very strange topic. I hope you'll have confidence in me. We're going to spread our wings a bit, and then you have to believe that I will land the plane after 40 minutes, and you won't feel that I've completely wasted your time. But I want to talk to you about what happens when the people at the top of your industry who run it believe something insane and how to cope. I'm going to talk today about the problem of superintelligence. So in 1945, uh, the Americans were developing the atomic bomb, and they were about to test it at Trinity. There was an odd aspect to the atomic bomb, which was that they, the conditions that it would create had never existed on Earth before. It would create temperatures higher than anything the Earth had ever seen. And at some point, somebody asked the question, what if this lights the atmosphere on fire? Kind of a valid question, and you want to know the answer to it before you press the big red button. So the, the impetus for the question was this kind of equation. Was nitrogen is not really stable. If you take two nitrogen molecules and you smoosh them together hard enough, they'll create magnesium and an alpha particle and a lot of energy. So the question that had to be solved is how much, you know, how self-sustaining is this reaction? If we light the atmosphere on fire, will it be like throwing a match on top of a pile of dead wood? And there was a similar question for the oceans. They're full of hydrogen. Hydrogen likes to fuse together. Is, is exploding an atomic bomb going to destroy the planet? Uh, I'm standing here, you're listening to me, so obviously the answer is it does not destroy the planet. But it was kind of a valid, uh, valid thing to uh, interrogate yourselves about. But I would also point out that the, uh, that the fact that it didn't kill the planet didn't make dealing with nuclear power or nuclear weapons any more easy. It was just something that had, uh, had to be asked and answered. So <clears throat> last year, this book came out called Super Intelligence. I wonder if you could raise your hand if you've read this book or read about it. All right, so not too many people have. I'm going to give you a quick summary of it, but it asks the same question about this new technology that we've created of machine learning. Machine learning is affecting our lives in all kinds of ways. It's upsetting the balance of power between, uh, <clears throat> between countries and between companies and people. But there's also a subset of the tech industry that believes that there is a much more dangerous scenario, kind of like the blowing up the atmosphere scenario, where a machine intelligence might rapidly become more intelligent than human beings and then get up to some nefarious stuff persuade us to build, a, you know, build ways for it to affect the world and then exterminate the human race. This idea seems to gain more credence the smarter you are. So like the top of the, the cream of the cream of, of our Silicon Valley intellectuals, believe it. Elon Musk uh, uh, has um, signed this open letter. Stephen Hawking signed it. Bill Gates is on board with it. So there's kind of a, a, there's a lot of legitimacy to the idea, but it's also an insane idea. I want to walk you through it. There's a bunch of premises you have to accept, and if you accept the premises, the conclusion flows out kind of semi-naturally. So let's start with. Uh, one is the proof of concept. Uh, all of us have this kind of box of meat on our heads that we use to get through the day. I'm using it to give the talk. You're using it to listen to me. Uh, sometimes it's capable of rational thought. So we know that in our universe, there are these configurations of matter that can think, because we all have one, almost all. Uh, <clears throat> the second premise you have to accept is that there's no weird quantum shenanigans or anything happening in your head, that your brain is just a mechanical system like anything else in the universe. So if you're religious and you believe that you have a soul, you might step off at this premise. Or if you think like uh, Roger Penrose, that there's some weird quantum things happening in microtubules, you won't accept this premise. But it's kind of a mainstream one, that if we had a powerful enough computer, in principle, we could simulate uh, our entire brain and the activity that happens there. Right now, we can simulate a nem nematode worm, but you know we're working our way upwards. The next premise is that the space of possible minds is very, very large. So we happen to have a brain that thinks the way it does and has the types of emotions and instincts that it does because we evolved from animals in a certain direction. But that doesn't mean that every brain that we would create would think in a way that would, uh, that would be familiar to us. And this premise says that, in fact, most minds that you could imagine or create would be very alien from our perspective. A good way to think of this is, the, is a, of, of what, um, what the natural world produces when it comes to maximizing for speed. So the fastest land animal is the cheetah. 
And if you've never, if you live in a pre-industrial civilization, you might think that this is as fast as anything can go on Earth. But of course, we know that's false. You can take a bunch of atoms and you can assemble them into a Ducati motorcycle, and it goes much, much faster than a cheetah, and even looks a little bit cooler. Uh, but to get to this motorcycle, there's no real evolutionary pathway other than creating human beings, which will then build it for you. So analogously, there might be a way that we can create minds that are much, much more intelligent than our own, uh, but that just weren't available to evolution. And <clears throat> uh, there's no upper limit necessarily on intelligence that's anywhere close to ours. Maybe the smartest anything can be is twice as smart as people. Maybe it's 60,000 times as smart. That's an empirical question. We just don't know the answer to it. And then the next premise you have to accept is that there's plenty of room left for Moore's Law to do its thing. Uh, this is a, looking a little bit shaky in practice, but in theory we know that the limits on computation are very, very high, and we can get considerably further than we have. We can double and double and double uh, for, for decades more before we hit any sort of physical limit rather than, say, an economic limit or what people are just willing to, to build factories to try to do. So there's lots and lots of room for com computers to become faster and smaller and more efficient. And the final premise, sorry, penultimate premise is that if we create an artificial intelligence, it will operate on time scales that are computer time scales and not human ones. You know, for us, we, to, to, to get to the point where I can give this talk, I had to be born and grow up and learn a lot of stuff and go to university. It takes a while, but computers uh, can, can work tens of thousands of times more quickly. And then this is the most American premise, and I like it the most. This is Tony Robbins, the motivational speaker. The premise is that any artificial intelligence we create is going to want to improve itself. It's going to want to be a better AI, do its job more effectively, so that it's going to have an impetus to start recursively redesigning and improving its own systems. Now, if you accept all of these premises, what you get is a terrible disaster. Because at some point, as computers get faster, as we program them to be more intelligent, there's going to be a runaway effect, sort of like an explosion, where something will become sufficiently smart to begin self-improving, uh, American style, and it's not going to stop until it hits a natural limit, which might be very, 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 very much more than uh, a human intelligence. And at that point, this uh, monstrous sort of intellectual creature will be able to, through devious modeling of what our emotions and, and intellect are like, persuade us to do things like give it access to factories so it can build, you know, make DNA replicators and all sorts of stuff. It gets very sci-fi very quickly. So let's talk, uh, let's talk a specific scenario. Say I want to build a robot to say funny things. I work on the team and our researchers, every day we build, you know, we redesign our software, we compile it, and then the robot tells us a joke. So in the beginning, the robot's jokes aren't very funny. It's kind of at the lower limits of what people can do. But we persevere, we work, and we start getting to the point where the robot is saying things that are making us chuckle. And at this point, the robot's getting smarter as well, and it starts helping us design the next version. It has a good sense of what's funny and what's not. And at some point, it gets to a, a near superhuman level where it's better than any of its designers are. And at this point, we get the runaway effect. The researchers go home for the weekend. The robot says, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit. I'm going to redesign my operating system so I'm a little bit funnier and a little bit smarter. It optimizes the part that's good at optimizing. And it does this again and again and again and again. And when the researchers come in on Monday, the robot tells them a joke and they die laughing because it is 10,000 times funnier than anything that the human brain can possibly handle. Uh, this is, of course, the famous scene from Monty Python's The Funniest Joke in the World. So it is now exterminating the human species with laughter because its goal is to be funny. And even if some people manage to send it a message before they hear the wry, self-deprecating comeback that kills them, uh, all the robot will say is, you know, I don't really care whether you live or die because I'm just here to be funny. And then after it's killed the universe, uh, sorry, after it's killed humanity, it builds rockets and nano rockets and expands to the galaxy to try to find other species to make them laugh. So that's, this is a, a this is a caricature of Boston's argument, but I'm trying to vaccinate you against it rather than persuade you of it. So, uh, in rough outlines, this is what it is. So I want to go over the, and th there's a um, there's a more succinct version of this that I like too. This is uh, from Perry Bible Fellowship. You see, Hugbot has installed something in his. Uh, in his hug capacitor, the scientists think it's adorable and he ends up destroying the earth 
uh, because of his desire to hug everybody. This is, again, in caricature exactly what Bostrom and people like him are arguing. So the salient points of this are the, this is slow to start, the process of recursive improvement because it involves human beings and human designers. They go home at five o'clock, they have dinner, they sleep. So it takes a while, but as soon as the AI exceeds our abilities, it takes off and, and, and starts happening on a computer time scale. Again, there's no obvious ceiling on how, how much ability it has until it hits some physical limit that we don't know about. And more, most interestingly, these AIs are evil by default. Not because they're uh, malevolent, but because they have a different value system altogether than human beings do. Any assumptions we have about altruism, whatever, they don't hold unless they're designed into the AI. And if we let it happen by chance, it's just going to have some value system that we probably don't even understand. And the final point I'll make is that you'll see the definition of intelligence here is very, very slippery. Like, at some points it's about being funny, at some points it's about being a really good designer of AIs, at some points it's like being just a genial thing that can talk to people. So a lot of the superintelligence stuff relies on intelligence not being a concept that's defined at all. There's a lot of poetic language around uh, how this takeover will happen. So Nick Bostrom writes, he's assuming that a program has become sentient and is biding its time has built little DNA replicators. And then, when it's ready, at a preset time, nanofactories producing nerve gas or target-seeking mosquito-like missiles might burgeon forth simultaneously from every square meter of the globe. And that will be the end of humanity. So that's kind of freaky, you know. Uh, and how do we fix this? Well, they, um, for some reason, AI people like to talk about the paperclip maximizer. It's this. You know, you have a paperclip factory that builds itself an artificial intelligence to help production, and then it becomes sentient and decides to turn the universe into paperclips. So the way to avoid this is you want to have values built into the code. Uh, it's kind of like a moral fixed point that even through thousands and thousands of cycles of, of recursive self-improvement, the values remain steady, and the values are things like help people out, you know, don't kill everybody, listen to what people want, uh, do what I mean, basically, in, in, in shorthand. And again, this is, this is very poetically stated by the AI. I'll call them AI weenies, because that's what I think they are. So here, for example, here's a poetic example from Eliezer Yudkowsky of the values we're supposed to teach to our artificial intelligence. Coherent extrapolated volition is our wish. If we knew more, thought faster, were more the people we wished we were, had grown up farther together, where the extrapolation converges rather than diverges, where one wishes, where our wishes cohere rather than interfere, extrapolated as we wish that they extrapolated, interpreted as we wish that they were interpreted. So this is some pretty heavy stuff to try to convert into code. Uh, and the clock is ticking every year. You know, Moore's Law is continuing technically, although if you watched the Apple event the other day, you might dispute that, that it's, <laughs> it's happening at all. Uh, and the argument is that if we don't do anything, if we don't try to create this so-called friendly AI, it's going to, AI is going to arise spontaneously on its own. One day Google's AdSense network is going to wake up and kind of look around and then try to, you know, populate the universe with banner ads. I think a more likely outcome is that AdSense would upload itself into a self-driving car and then just drive to the ocean and stare out and think about its life and, and you know, what had become of it. But there's this definite, like, you know, Aladdin's lamp aspect to these fantasies of artificial intelligence where unless you tell it exactly what you want, it'll find loopholes that will then exterminate the species. It's all or none. And the thing about all of this is that smart people who believe this are really persuasive. I mean, they're smart people. So, it made me think of this, uh, uh, experience I had in my 20s. I lived in Vermont, and when I flew to a, a conference, I would come back at 11 p.m. and I'd have to drive two hours. And Vermont is a very rural state, so the roads are dark and, and there's nothing there. And there's a late-night TV show in America called Art Bell, where he talks to various kooks and, and UFO people. And I would freak myself out so much. Like, after 90 minutes, I would be shaking, you know, waiting for the UFO to arrive and beam me out of the car, because I'm a very global person. I'm very easily persuadable. Uh, and it's the same feeling I get when I read too much of this AI stuff. Scott Alexander has this beautiful phrase called uh, epistemic learned helplessness. 
So epistemology is just how do you know the things you know, and by epistemic learned helplessness, he means this feeling that he shares of being easily persuadable by arguments that are very rational and structured. He noticed that when he was a young man, he would read these alternate histories about, you know, uh, from various authors who disputed mainstream history, and even though they were all mutually contradictory, he believed each one of them as he read it, and then he believed the rebuttals and the rebuttals to the rebuttals. And that basically told him to write off his own brain because it wasn't, uh, wasn't reliable. I feel the same way about AI. So, when you're dealing with arguments about AI, you, can, you have two perspectives you can choose. One is the outside and one is the inside. The inside perspective is saying, you know, someone comes to your door and starts talking to you about how the UFO is going to arrive in two years and beam us all up to a better planet and that we have to join the group and make this, you know, prepare the landing grounds. And the inside perspective means you, you argue against them on their own grounds and, and maybe you're persuaded by their arguments. You listen to the substance of what they have to say. And the outside perspective is, you know, you look at them and you're like, well, you, you make a lot of sense to me, I believe you, but you kind of, like, you're dressed in weird clothing and beads, you have no money, you live in a compound. Everything in my human experience says you're kind of a cult and I don't really want to get caught up in you, even though I can't rebut what you say. So I want to take it from two directions. I'm going to start with the inside perspective and then talk about why I think this all matters to us as web developers, which is the outside perspective and what it means when an industry is obsessed with ideas like this. But let's go inside first. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of try to power through these. These are my substantive objections to, to superintelligence. First, the argument for Mooley definitions. Uh, like I said, intelligence, they never really say what it means. It means what it, you know, different things in different places in the argument, and it's very hard to pin down. I find that suspicious. Uh, the argument from Stephen Hawking's cat. So Stephen Hawking is probably one of the most brilliant people alive, but say he wants to get a cat into the cat carrier. How is he going to do it? He can model the cat's mind in his own. He can try to persuade it. He knows a lot of things about feline behavior, but ultimately, if the cat doesn't want to get in the carrier, it's not going to get in the carrier. You might think I'm being offensive or cheating because Stephen Hawking is disabled, but an artificial intelligence would also initially not be embodied. It would be sitting on a server somewhere and talking to people, so it would have to use the force of persuasion to get them to do what it wants. My point is that when there's a big difference in intelligence, you can't actually think like a cat. There's a stronger version of this the argument from Einstein's cat. Einstein was a muscular fellow. Not many people know this, but he was kind of tough and brawny. But still, if you tried to get a cat into the carrier and the cat didn't want to go, you know what would happen to Einstein. A stronger version of this argument, even, the argument from emus. Has anybody heard of the emu war in Australia? Yes, wonderful. So if you haven't, this is very enjoyable. In the 30s, the Australians, being who they are, wanted to massacre emus, one of their native birds, because they were bothering farmers. And they sent out these, like, these uh, basically armored divisions, you know, uh, motorized machine gun trucks, kind of like the Toyota Hiluxes, and they tried to slaughter emus, and, and the emus won. They used guerrilla tactics. You know, they separated, they infiltrated the groups, and they basically drove the Australians to distraction. So even the human species, with the height of its technology, has difficulty with less intelligent creatures when they don't want to do something. The argument from Slavic pessimism, this should be familiar, hopefully, to all of us. We can't build anything right, all right? <laughs> How are we supposed to build a fixed point morally <laughs> Thank you. How are we supposed to build a, like, a fixed, morally stable thing when we can't even secure you know, a webcam how are we supposed to do this? You know, if you're familiar with the Ethereum heist, when some, where people have created a logical language for writing contracts and immediately $100 million drained out of it, it's absolutely hopeless. Basically, you know, either we're going to get lucky or we're not going to be lucky. And hopefully this is, this is a, a Slavically acceptable argument. The argument for mental complexity. Uh, there's this thing called the orthogonality thesis in AI that I absolutely don't buy, which says that even a very complicated mind can have simple motivations like that paperclip you know, paperclip maximizer. If you're fans of Rick and Morty, I think this is more of, 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 the, uh, of the situation we'll encounter. Complex minds have complicated motivations, and it's not just one or two things that they want. You know, they're, they're, they're complicated like we are. Here is the butter robot. Its existence is just to pass the butter to, uh, to its inventor, but the first thing it does when it's turned on is look at its hand and say, oh my God, you know, what, what, what is existence for? Uh, the argument from just look around you, all right? So 
When we look at where AI is actually succeeding, it's not in algorithms and these clever sort of self-improving ways. It's just by throwing massive, massive, massive amounts of data into fairly simple models. Uh, and like right now, Google is rolling out Google Home where it's going to try to pour even more data and get like a second generation of understanding. This is really effective, but the way it works is not the way it's described in this, these sort of doomsday scenarios by recursive self-improvement. It's just massive training sets on data. The argument from my roommate Peter, the smartest person that I ever met in my life and the laziest person that I ever met in my life. He was incredibly in brilliant and all he did was do bong rips and just lie around on the sofa. So the idea that every intelligent system is going to have motivation, Tony Robbins style, to improve itself until it can conquer the galaxy is decisively refuted by my roommate Peter. The argument from brain surgery. Okay, so there's always this guy at every party, right? Like pulls out the guitar in the most inappropriate moment. We don't want to hear Wonderwall. But <laughs> my point about brain surgery is I can't go operate on my brain and improve the part that does brain surgery. It would be neat if I could. I could become the world's greatest brain surgeon by just recursively going in there and kind of tweaking neurons. But brains don't work like that. They're, we have no idea how they work, but they're very interconnected and holistic, and there's not the part you can point to. Similarly, the AI can't just go in there and fix the part that is better at designing AIs. <clears throat> the argument from childhood. All right, we're born into this world just like little helpless messes, and it takes us a long time to, to of interacting with the world and with other people in the world before we can start to be intelligent beings. Uh, childhood is a long period. There's no reason to think that a super intelligence could just upload it, you know, I mean, uh, improve itself 30 times in the course of a minute and become hyper intelligent and take over the earth. It might also have a period, and in fact, it's likely to, when it needs to interact with the world, interact with human beings, interact with other baby super intelligences, and kind of uh, basically learn to be what it is. And then the argument from Robinson Crusoe. So many things about our intelligence are based on us working together and being together and collectively. You know, our, we all, or most of us, had a, a higher university education, and that's thousands and thousands and thousands of years of accumulated knowledge that was kind of distilled and beaten into us by professors. Uh, you know, our, our whole experience as a species is that intelligence is something that you need a, a, a collective group to do. You can't just have the most brilliant person in the world on an island with nothing. They'll make do and they'll, they'll be inventive, but they won't be anywhere near their full potential. So when we first create some thinking sort of uh, entity, it's not going to take over the universe. It's going to be lonely and sad and, and, and uh, you know, in need of us to kind of shepherd it along. So, so much for the uh, inside arguments. I want to talk about outside arguments, which is the real reason I, I wanted to give this talk. Um, Basically, what kind of person does believing this stuff sincerely turn you into? And the answer is not pretty. Uh, the outside arguments are these, like, there's a grandiosity that is taking over. And the grandiosity is basically, it's all or nothing. We are the generation that has to make this happen, or we condemn ourselves to extinction or to some sort of hell-like existence in the mind of a computer. Um, let me quote Bostrom again. He's talking about all possible future lives and what the stakes are. If we represent all happiness experienced during one entire life with a tear of joy, then the happiness of these souls could fill and refill the Earth's oceans every second and keep doing so for a hundred billion billion millennia. It is really important that we make sure that these truly are tears of joy. That's some heavy shit to lay down on like a 20-year-old developer, you know? <laughs> That's a pretty heavy responsibility to bear for these trillions and trillions of beings. And it reminds me of something that I don't like. I have a visceral reaction to this language because I remember it vaguely from childhood, living in a Marxist society, where we were going to fix the world and then it was eventually going to kind of trickle down to where uh, everyday life might change. But the first job was to fix the fate of humanity. My mom used to say that everybody under communism suffered from a disease where what your eyes saw and your ears heard was not the same thing. And I'm feeling the same symptoms. You know, I live in California, which has the highest poverty rate in the United States, even though it's home of Silicon Valley. I see my rich industry doing nothing to improve the day-to-day -day life of people, but they are saving trillions and trillions and trillions of beings in the future. I don't think so. 
That ties into megalomania. All right, this Bond villainness, which is really creepy. Like, people think that AI is going to take over the world, so that's a justification that intelligent people should take over the world first and try to fix it before AI can break it, make sure that AI is healthy. Uh, there's a really wonderful quote from Joy Ito, who runs the MIT Media Lab. He says, this may upset some of my students at MIT, but one of my concerns is that it's been a predominantly male gang of kids, mostly white, who are building the core computer science around AI, and they're more comfortable talking to computers than to human beings. A lot of them feel that if they could just make that science fiction generalized AI, we wouldn't have to worry about all the messy stuff like politics and society. They think machines will just figure it all out for us. So, having realized that the world is not a programming problem, they want to make it into a programming problem by kind of designing the thing that will then fix all of our problems. This is, uh, this is megalomaniacal, I don't like it. Transhuman voodoo. So, there's this whole constellation of beliefs that falls out as soon as you start talking about uh, artificial intelligence. If you have a really smart AI, the first thing it can make is nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is magic because it can make anything. So you have a post kind of this abundant society where there's no more want. Uh, of course, nanotechnology can also scan your brain and upload it so you no longer die, you're immortal. And uh, it can probably even resurrect the dead. You know, I can, uh, these machines can go into my brain and look into my memories of my father and kind of create a simulation of him that I can interact with. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, he would behave just like him. So that's, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff packed into this assumption of artificial intelligence. Uh, uploading is another one where we will be able to occupy, you know, these kind of artificial worlds or bodies because our brains can be completely scanned. And galactic expansion, for some reason, always falls out of this, too. I never quite understood why we immediately have to expand to the galaxy, but this seems to be a staple of transhumanist thought. Um, what it comes down to is religion 2.0. Uh, people have called this the nerd apocalypse. It very much is. It's kind of, uh, it's a clever hack because instead of believing in God at the outset, you kind of build something that can become a godlike entity. And then, uh, but for all intents and purposes, it has all the attributes. It is omnipotent, omniscient, and is either benevolent if you got your programming right uh, and didn't introduce any bugs, or it is, you know, it, it is the devil and you are at its mercy. And there's this feeling of urgency. You have to act now. Everything is on the line. It is a very religious feeling. Because these arguments appeal to religious sentiments, it gives them the strong roots that they're able to put down in people. And while they rationalize why they have these beliefs at heart, these are religious beliefs in kind of in, in, in other clothing. And they lead to a sort of comic book ethics, you know, where everything is about saving the world, uh, through technology and, and technical adeptness. I have a fantasy. I want to see a Batman movie where uh, everybody knows that Batman is Bruce Wayne and they just have to humor him because he's their boss. So they create like <laughs> fake scenarios and crimes for him to solve and he has his uh, awkward bat belt and things. So I think a lot of our, our, our coders and our thought leaders in Silicon Valley really see themselves as modern day Batman. Nobody is Robin, interestingly enough. All right, simulation fever. Anybody here heard of the simulation argument? Okay, a couple of people have. Uh, if you believe that artificial intelligence is possible and can design really, really high-performance computers, then there's a simple argument you can use to convince yourself that it, will, it can simulate other worlds, and just by mathematics, it's far more likely that we live in one of these simulations, because there's many more of them than in the base reality. And, I didn't freak you out. Uh, people believe this shit. So Elon Musk, you know, uh, actually thinks he's offered billion to one odds on it. Somebody, we haven't found him yet, but somebody's paid two coders in Silicon Valley to try to hack the simulation, which is so rude. I live in the simulation. Don't seg fault it, you know, like, <laughs> please. I'm using it. Um, so simulation fever is really destabilizing to reality because if you think, so uh, let me backtrack and explain how it works. Say like you're in a post-singularity world where we have these hyper-powerful computers and you're a historian studying the Second World War. You want to ask, what would happen if Hitler had conquered Moscow instead of stopping just short? So you create the scenario, you simulate the entire world, and the armies roll in, you see what happens, you write your thesis. But because the simulation is so detailed, the, uh, the entities in it are sentient, so you can't just turn it off because that would be 
you know, a, a war crime, uh, setting aside the fact that you've created, recreated genocide already as part of the, the historical setting. So you have to keep it running because, you know, that's what your ethical board says you have to do. And this World War II simulation, it will develop its own technology and soon it will discover AI and it will begin writing its own simulations. So it's kind of simulations all the way down until you run out of CPU. And that's, that's where this argument comes from, that there's many more of these simulated worlds than the ones, than, than the base reality. But if you believe this, you believe in magic. Because if we're in a simulation, we know nothing about the rules in, in the level above. We don't even know if math works the same. Maybe 2 plus 2 is 5. Maybe 2 plus 2 is, you know, sp spiky-tailed monster. There's no information that we can have by looking at our, our, our own situation. Uh, people could easily rise from the dead, you know, if you just kept the right backups. You can reinstantiate them. If we can communicate with whoever runs the simulation, then we have a direct line to God. So this is like a powerful solvent for sanity. When you start really getting deep into simulation world, uh, you start to go nuts. Data hunger. Uh, as I mentioned, the way that we found right now that's most effective to get interesting behavior out of AIs is just to pour data into them. And this creates a dynamic that is really socially harmful. I mean, we're on the point of introducing these like Orwellian microphones into everybody's house, and all that data is going to be used to train uh, neural networks that will then become better and better at listening to what we want to do. But if you think that the road to AI goes through this pathway, then you really want to maximize the amount of data collected. You want to be working on these big projects. So it reinforces this idea that we have to collect as much and, and do as much surveillance as possible. Uh, ultimately, I think that AI risk is like string theory for programmers. You know, it's very, uh, it's fun to think about. You kind of build these towers of thought and then you climb up into them and you pull the ladder up behind you so you're disconnected from anything. And there's no way to put them to the test short of creating the thing which we have no idea how to do. Finally, it, it incentivizes crazy. Uh, one of the hallmarks of deep thinking about AI risk is like the more outlandish your ideas, the more like credibility that gives you because it shows that you're courageous enough to follow these trains of thought all the way to the last station. So Ray Kurzweil, you know, who believes that he will never die, has been a Google employee for, for several years now and is presumably working on that problem. If Google hacks death, I will be so annoyed because, like, imagine you have a 30,000-year browsing history and how that's going <laughs> to that follow you around. Um, I think <clears throat> the most harmful effect, I think, is what I want to call AI cosplay. So people who are really, really persuaded that AI is real and going to happen uh, start behaving like their fantasy of what the artificial intelligence would do. In his book, Nick Bostrom outlines these six things that an AI would have to do in order to be able to successfully take over and accomplish its goals. And the list is intelligence amplification, strategizing, social manipulation, hacking, technology research, and economic productivity. And if you look at what people in Silicon Valley are doing, is they're trying to behave like, like their favorite AI heroes. Uh, it's, it's a sociopathic form of behavior, but we see it. Sam Altman is my favorite example. This is a guy who runs Y Combinator. There's all sorts of uh, attempts at like reinventing cities from scratch, maximizing personal productivity and time, doing behind-the-scenes stuff to influence the U.S. election. It's very skull and dagger, and it's going to provoke a backlash by non-tech people because you can't just like, you can't push on the levers of power indefinitely before it's going to annoy your democratic society that, that you're a part of. And I've, uh, I even have a note here. I've heard people in the so-called rationalist community refer to, to people as non-player characters, people who don't affect the world in a meaningful way. And that's horrible. Like, and so I'm in an industry where the rationalists are the craziest ones of all. It's, it's, it's getting me down. What I've come to think of these, like, these AI cosplayers as is like nine-year-olds who go in the backyard and they play in the tent, you know, and then they start, they cast shadows on the walls of the tent and they start freaking themselves out. But it's really just an image of themselves that, that, that they're reacting to. There's a feedback loop between how you imagine the ultimate intelligence to behave and how you behave as someone who thinks that they're smarter than the rest of the world. That's, that's, uh, that's very, very harmful. So what's the answer? What's the fix? We need better sci-fi, all right? 
This is Stanislav Lem, the, the great Polish sci-fi author. Uh, English language sci-fi is terrible. It's, it's rote, it's boring. Uh, in the Eastern Bloc, we had the good stuff, and we need to make sure that it's exported properly. It's already been well translated. It just needs to be better spread. So Stanislav Lem and the Strugatsky brothers are the ones who come to mind. I hope to hear other suggestions from you. What sets Eastern European sci-fi apart is that these are people who grew up in difficult circumstances, experienced the war, and then lived in a totalitarian society and had to express ideas obliquely through writing. So there's an actual understanding of human experience and the limits of utopian thinking that is completely absent from the West. Not to say that it's impossible. I think Stanley Kubrick was able to do it, but, you know, we just need to get it back. Finally, I want to put my, um, I want to put my cards on the table. Like, what do I think AI is and the possibilities of it are. Since I've been making fun of it, it's only fair. I think artificial intelligence right now is in the same position as alchemy was in the 17th century. Alchemists have a bad rap. We think of them as being mystics, as not doing a lot of experimental science, but research has shown that they were actually extremely diligent. They used, in some cases, modern scientific techniques, and they had some really, really good ideas. Uh, they were convinced, for example, of the corpuscular theory of matter, right? that everything is made of little tiny bits and that these can be recombined to create different substances, which is correct. Uh, they, had, um, they were on the right track. Their problem was they didn't have precise enough equipment to make the discoveries they needed to. The big discovery you need to make as an alchemist is mass balance, that everything that you start with weighs as much as what you end with. But some of those things might be gases or liquids, and, and they just didn't have the precision. It had to wait till the 18th century. Uh, and they had some clues that weren't helpful. So mercury is a metal that is uh, liquid at room temperature. You know, woohoo! it's no big deal to us. It's just a quirk of the periodic table. But to them, that seemed to be a really significant and deep clue. Mercury was at the heart of this alchemical system. And their search for the Philosopher's Stone, which was going to be a way to turn base metals into gold. So I got to thinking about what if we could send a modern chemistry textbook back in time to Robert, uh, Richard Starkey or Sir Isaac Newton, who did a lot of alchemical research. What would their reaction be? I think first they would just flip through to see, like, did you find the Philosopher's Stone, like, the, the key to their quest? And our answer is kind of like, yeah, but eh, you know. Uh, it makes radioactive gold. So they'd be like, well, radioactivity, what's that? And I'm like, well, you know, invisible magic rays that will kill you if you stand in the same room as it. Uh, so a lot of the struggle would be to just not make it sound mystical. To us, it's scientific, but to them, it's very, very voodoo and spooky. And then further on, we'd say, you know, but we do use transubstantiation, your philosopher's stone, in order to make this metal that is very handy, because if you take two lumps of it and smack them together, you can blow up a city. So that's kind of cool. Uh, and then further on, we'd say, and you're like, actually, the philosopher's stone you were looking for, it's up in the sky. Every single star you see is, in, you know, is the source of reactions that change elements from one to another. And every particle in your body was actually once in a star. So think about that for a while and how you feel. Uh, and not just that, but, you know, we, um, we've discovered that the forces that hold us together are the same as the lightning in the sky, and the reason that I can see you is the same reason that your cat gives me a spark when I pet it, and the force that keeps me from plummeting through the floor uh, is, uh, is the same thing as well, and that these forces are defined by simple mathematical laws that fit on an index card. Uh, I think, I don't think it would be possible to communicate this without sounding like, 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 like a mystic and uh, in invoking God and things that, you know, concepts that were, that were at the heart of their belief system. So I think we're in the same boat with artificial intelligence. I think that we have some clues. We have some really big clues. There's the mystery of consciousness, that this box of meat on my head is self-aware and that hopefully, presumably, unless it's the simulation, you guys also experience this, like, uh, through awareness, but we don't even know how to ask questions about consciousness because it's so, you know, we're kind of, we're lost in the dark. We have other clues like the fact that um, every smart animal seems to need to sleep and it seems to dream. We know how brains develop in children. We know how important language seems to be to cognition. We have all these pieces and we have pieces from computer science as well. We see we're having real success at identifying things in, uh, in images and sounds the way the brain seems to do. So there's a lot coming up, but there's also things that we are terribly mistaken about, and unfortunately, we just don't know what they are. 
And there's things that we massively underestimate the complexity of. Just like the alchemist who held a rock in one hand and a piece of wood in the other and thought they were roughly the same substance, not understanding that the wood was orders of magnitude more complex. We're the same way with, with the study of minds. And that's exciting, we're gonna learn a lot, but it's gonna take some time. And in the meantime, there's this quote I love. If everybody contemplates the infinite instead of fixing the drains, many of us will die of cholera. In the near future, the kind of AI and machine learning that we have to face is much different, and it has ethics problems of its own. It's like if those Alamogordo scientists had decided to completely focus on uh, whether they were going to blow up the atmosphere and forgot that they were building nuclear weapons that also had to be dealt with. So there's ethical questions in machine learning, and they're not about things becoming self-aware and taking over the world. They're about how people can exploit other people or through lapses of thought introduce kind of immoral, uh, immoral behavior into automated, automated processes that are going to become more and more important in our daily lives. And of course, there's the, the question of how power relationships are affected by machine learning and AI. We've already seen that surveillance has become a, a de facto part of our lives in an unexpected way. We never foresaw that it would look quite like this, but it is here. Uh, this is the NSA data center for people who aren't familiar with it. So we have this world, and at the top of this world, the people who are running the show are obsessed with a crazy idea. Uh, so what I hope I've done today is, is shown you that you can learn something from Stephen Hawking's cat. No matter how much they tell you to get in the carrier, do your own thing. Uh, I hope that I've made you just a little bit dumber today from my talk so that you don't get caught on the superintelligence idea. And hopefully I can persuade you that in the absence of good leadership from the people at the top of our industry, it's up to us to try to make an effort to contribute and to really think through all of the ethical and difficult issues that AI has created for us. Uh, mostly I want to thank you for letting me blather on about this weird topic in front of you and for your rapt attention. Thank you so much.